All right, here we are. We are Comp 308. That's Emerging Technologies, right? And it's uh, in the winter 2017 semester at Centennial. And we are week one, part one of our broadcasts. Um, again, this is my blue ice microphone, right? So it's uh, I got it for Christmas. I figured I'd start using it. And it's better than a headset. What are we talking about today? Um, I want to bring up actually... I want to bring up um, our course outline. Not Costco, Coco. Um, that would be, sorry. Here. So our course outline for this one, and again, I, I got to talk about the course outline that's approved, the one that we're using, right? But I'm also going to talk about some slight changes, right? It's not going to be major change this for this one because it's a pretty good one, a uh, course outline was, right? So uh, Professor Ilya, he's the one that kind of created it and updated it. How you doing? So let's talk about the book that we're going to be using. The book that uh, Professor Ilya wants us to use, and I agree with it. It's, a, it's the book that I kind of chose a couple, of, a couple of years ago when we first started Emergency Tech, is this one, Mean Web Development. I like this one. It's available through Safari Books Online, so it's free. I recommend another book, though, and, I, and I'm going to bring this up for you. So if I looked at Mean Web Development, right, this one here, if I was going to search for it, so packed, or packed, right? It's this book, right, that we're talking about. Again, I want to point out that this one is free through Safari Books Online. Now, this is the old one. This is 2014, right? There's actually another one, um, the this, this second edition which is the one we want, right? So it's Mean Web Development second edition, not the first, this is the first edition, the September 2014. The new one, I think it's second edition. Yeah. I think it's this one. Yes, November 2016. So it's fairly recent. That's why we're using this one. This is the, the book that we're using for the course. It's a relevant book. Why? Because, yeah? Yeah. Two, right? I know it's crazy, right? So, we'll talk about that in a second. So, he, the question was: Are we learning mean? Are we doing Angular two? It's supposed to be doing Angular two here in this course. That's what the that the learning is all about. Um, one of the great thing is when you grab a pack book, you can always grab the code files from the book to test things with. This is good. And also the uh, this book itself, like I said, is available through Safari Books Online as well as Toronto Public Library. So, if you're a Toronto Public Library user, um, you can always go back and search for mean web development. And you can see that if I kind of scroll down here, right, for mean web development, you'll see that um, there's another book, right, which is also done by, um, by the same author. And it was done around the same time. And this is why I recommend this book more, Web Application Development with Mean. It's written in 2016 with a couple of other authors, right? And the great thing about this book is it includes the first book plus extra in, uh, extra um, information, extra examples, which is awesome. To give you an example of this, I've kind of downloaded and I bought both books, right? So here's the first book, right? So this is the one I bought. And it has these chapters. So here's chapter one, Introduction to Mean, right? There it is. So it talks about Mongo as a database and so on. I'm going to do more of this work, introduction to mean and all that kind of stuff, next week in detail. And we're going to talk about that. Um, ECMAScript 2015 is what uh, Professor Ilya started off with in arrow functions. We're going to be talking a little bit about that uh, today. But more or less, if you look at this, this is the book, right? OK, that's this book. Now take a look at this one. This is web uh, application development with me. This is a more expensive book, however. This is like 80 bucks if you were going to buy it. It's a great resource. And the reason for that is because not only does it include web application development, this is module one. It's broken down into three modules. In fact, it's three different books in one, right? So here's introduction to me, right? Same thing as before. The reason why I like this book a little bit more is because module two is all about building uh, e-commerce applications with me, right? Which is going to help you with your final project. Okay, so this is why I recommend this one. Module three 
is mean blueprints where you can build some some example apps a contact manager an expense tracker a job board and so on all kinds of really cool things with me this is of course these things are not included in the original book that's on the outline now the outline has the, the you know that book and I recommend this book as a better resource so please if you're gonna think about downloading or buying something or even looking it up with um, you know, up online, like here, I'm, I'm a Toronto Public Library here. I'm just going to access the Toronto Public Library here. I'm going to log in as me. So here's my public library card. Like, I log in as an example. And when I log in as me, what it's going to look like is this, right? Here's my table of contents, and here's module one, and then I can actually see intro to me. So it's going to look like this. So the whole thing is available for free. There's nothing for you to buy. Right, which is a really good positive. Okay, and that's what Safari Books on. It is Safari Books Online. I'm just going through trying to public library to get there. You can also go through the links that from through Centennial. There's actually Centennial links for Toronto, for Safari uh, Books Online that are up on the uh, on the outline. The other book that we're going to be using is Developing Microservices with Node.js because the latter part of, and that's a pretty good book, I have to say. Um, the latter part of um, this course, we're going to be talking about microservices. Okay, so here's what's happening in terms of assignments. Uh, now we postmark five assignments, right, and a project, right, and it's broken out like this. Typically, you've got eight marks or eight percent for assignment one and two, fourteen percent for assignment three. It's a little bit more involved. Ten percent for assignment four, and five percent for assignment five. I'm probably going to wrap five assignments into four, right? Instead of doing five assignments, I'll do four assignments, right? So that's where the differences will be. I'll give you the schedules, and most likely what I'm gonna do this week if I have time is I'd like to put all the assignments up so you can start them early, or uh, if you wanna finish them early, it's totally fine. I'm gonna give you all the assignments ahead of time as much as possible, right? And the final project too. The final project will be a group project, right? But you can decide to do this on your own if you really want to. I have it. I mean, I'll tell you, I've had experience doing this kind of material in uh, here and at other institutions, and I don't recommend you doing this on your own, right? You can, but it's really big, and you're going to have a bunch of other assignments and projects all do all at the same time. So it's not because it's hard; it's just you don't have the cycles, and it might be a better thing for you to work with somebody else to get this done to lighten your load, right? If you really want to do it on your own, you can, but I recommend against it. Professor Ilya is also going to have these in-class interactive exercises, right? And it's for a grade, right? He's kind of postmarked these as labs that are worth about 10%, okay? Now, again, I probably won't be doing this. And the reason why is because from a time perspective, the time we have and the time he has is totally different. He has two classes, you know, I, I, or, or sorry, he's doing classes like day one, day two style. I'm doing classes all in one, right? And that presents a different uh, set of problems for us and challenges and good things too, right? We'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages, right? This one keeps dropping out for some reason. I don't know why. Okay, so uh, test one is definitely going to happen. It's worth 25% of your final grade, and that's going to be around week seven, all right? So that's before you go on break, right? Test one is going to happen. This is our midterm test. All right, that's what's happening, right? And then we're going to have our final project, which is going to broken up, be broken out into several releases, small little releases. And if you look at the schedule near the bottom, there is no final exam for this course, right, or final test. It's just presentations. And it says week one to 13 materials we're going to use. But ge generally, we have a four-hour block uh, for you and your partners to present what you've built in Node.js at the end. That's the what we're doing at the end for uh, you know week 14. By the way, we depending on the time frame and how many how many people need to present, I'm going to have a, a, a sign up sheet for presentations. Right? I may need two weeks to do it. I'm telling you right now, only because there's that many people uh, across the courses, and there might be too many groups. If there's too many groups, I may have to try and and put the groups together a little bit because I can't have everyone an individual it's impossible there's just not enough time to do presentations so my recommendation is groups of four okay um 
And you might say, well, what's everyone going to do, right? But it's a big thing. To do a Node app and to do some kind of interactive app with Node, there is you know, the whole view aspect, how to do the views properly, how to connect to Mongo, who's going to do the, um, as an example, all the, uh, on the data side, who's going to work with the data, right? Um, and every, there's enough work for everybody to be involved, especially from a planning perspective and an organizational perspective, right? So four people should be perfectly fine to work on this. I think anything more than four is an undoable, it's too many. And anything less than four, you can probably get away with doing it with groups of three, right? Groups of two would be pretty intense. Just, not, just letting you know. Like I know some people like to work in groups of two, right? And the reason why is because there's just so much to do or in this course. Now some people have no choice, so they, they prefer work with certain partners or whatever. That's fine, but I'm urging you for the most of you, work in groups of four if you can, okay? Let's keep going back in terms of what we're teaching here. So the first part and Professor Ilya did this. He talked about uh, ECMAScript 2015, class of zero functions, and so that that's all part of chapter one. Notice that chapter one in his outline is broken up over two weeks. I'm just going to do chapter one next week. All right, so that's where I'm going to start chapter one. Okay. Today is setup day for us. That's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be setting that up, setting up GitHub. I'm going to go through some detailed explanations of GitHub for people who haven't done GitHub before or who have forgotten, right? or who kind of scratched the surface with GitHub last semester or the semester before, right? So I'm gonna be talking about that because GitHub is one of our requirements. I'm also, I've also set up a Slack channel for this group, right? And we're gonna be talking about that. So that's kind of a communication channel we're gonna be using. Next week, we're gonna get right into mean. Now it says here, Node.js is a whole week, that's chapter two. And then chapter three is express. These two, I might compress into week three. And I'll tell you why because there's only so much I can talk about with Node. And when I introduce mean, you know, again, I might compress some of this stuff. I might do like chapter one and two next week and then chapter three the week on, on the third week. Either way, you're probably gonna get Express a week earlier, right? Only because we're gonna do most of our work with Express, right? We're not gonna do too much with Node. We're gonna do a little bit of Node today. We're gonna talk about setting up Node and everything else, but most of it, it's gonna be with Express, okay? I'm still gonna follow the chapters, just the outline schedule is slightly different, right? Mongo, we're definitely gonna spend a week and two weeks doing Mongo, for sure. Mongoose with Mongo. Um, Mongoose is the way for us to connect um, to Mongo and and, um, and Node, right? So intro to Mongo and Mongoose. We may have to do, again, these two are gonna be combined weeks, so week five and six. It might be week four, five, and six, just letting you know, because Mongo and CRUD and all that kind of stuff is very difficult to manage before week seven. So I'm gonna try and get, this is what my goal is, I wanna try and get authentication done by week six. So I mean, it's like chapter six is gonna be over here, right? So why am I compressing the schedule a little bit? Because without proper authentication, right? And with um, with everything, I want you guys to be able to do full CRUD with Mongo by week six, right? So that week seven, we can have an open, like kind of an open uh, book test, hands-on, where you build something with Mongo. Okay, that's the, that's the goal of the midterm test, okay? So it means like it's physically here. Um, it's the one day that I'm gonna ask you to be on time. Like everyone's gotta be here by one o'clock. We're gonna start sharp, right? And then your test will be a hands-on test. Now for people who are in the first uh, section, right? So section one starts at 8.30 in the morning. Um, they'd have to be there at 8.30 in the morning. So this is, the, this is gonna be our test week, week seven, right? Now week eight, notice that we start Angular 2 around week eight. I'll be honest with you, I'm probably gonna talk about some other technologies in week six and seven, because we have some time. We have a little bit different schedule because when as we're moving towards uh, week eight, you need to know TypeScript a little bit. If you don't know TypeScript and you're trying to do Angular 2, you're gonna have a bit of a problem and we're gonna talk about that later on, right? Um, because ECMAScript 6 is okay, but TypeScript is pretty much required for Angular 2. Now, he handles Angular 2, the guy, the book author, he handles Angular 2 pretty much in a week. <laughs> it's impossible for you to do Angular 2 in a week. Impossible, right? Notice also that he's kind of book, kind of postmark group project requirements. But meanwhile, we also have assignment three is due, right? By the following week, right? This is where our schedule is gonna be slightly different. Right, like he's got assignment three in here. 
I'm probably going to give you an assignment next week. You're going to have a couple weeks to do it. That's one assignment one. Assignment two by week four, right? And then you're going to get assignment three by week six, which is probably going to be due over the break when you come back. Why am I going to do this? Because you guys need to know, have enough assignments so that when you do your midterm, you're good to go, right? If I don't do that, if I don't give you at least a couple of assignments before midterm, midterms can be very challenging, right? And I don't want to make it challenging. It's worth 25% of your final grade. I don't want to kill you with it. I want to make it doable, right? Which means you need practice. And we're going to talk about that. So Angular 2, you're probably going to know a little bit of TypeScript before we get into Angular 2, because I can't teach TypeScript and Angular 2. Look, it says introduce and install TypeScript. There's no way I want to do this in one session. It's just too much. So I'm probably going to bring it way up here. You know, when we start talking about Express and stuff around week four, so in a, a few weeks, we'll be talking about TypeScript. Because I want you to kind of know what TypeScript is, how to install it, and everything else way ahead of time. So by the time we get to Angular, you're not burdened with that extra piece of knowledge. So we're going to kind of handle some Chapter 7 information a lot earlier, right? All right. Now, he's doing a, when he says a, a mean CRUD module, that means with Angular as well. We've already done CRUD by this point with Mongo. So MongoDB is our database, a NoSQL database that we're going to be talking about in this course, right? It's not, so when we say NoSQL, it does not use um, structured query language in any way, right? It is a flat JavaScript database that resembles JSON a lot in the way it's formatted, right? So it's JavaScript everywhere is why, what this course is all about. JavaScript on the front end, JavaScript on the back end, JavaScript to the, to the database. And so that, you know, by the end of this course, you should be very comfortable using JavaScript. Actually, either that or you'll be in JavaScript hell, right? One of the two. All right. Um, this is the most exciting piece for me. So you do, we do a CRUD module in week nine. Now week 10, 11, and 12 is microservices. And notice it says chapter one of the microservices book is what we're going to be handling in week 10. And chapters two, three, and four, right, of the book, um, you know, for week 11 and 12. This is really cool. Microservices is something that's new and emerging and something that uses Node and Express, right, to produce a back end that we can use to tap into with things like mobile devices, um, Internet of Things, and other services. This is really exciting stuff. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, um, to tap into um, uh, microservices near the end, 10, 11, and 12. If I have the ability to do so, and I don't know if I can, I might bring it even up a little further, the introduction at the end of week nine, because only because there's just so much to do and three weeks just don't, or two weeks don't do it justice, right? So it might be 10, 11, 12, and 13 for microservices. I don't know, right, uh, how that's going to go. This part here, emerging cloud technologies, this is neat, this little part, and it's all around uh, Docker, um, and how Docker is on the rise in terms of the way they do VMs and uh, separation of containers up on the cloud. Really neat idea uh, kind of thing. Again, um, we'll see how it goes as we move forward. But more or less, I'm going to stick with the schedule. It just might be compressed in certain weeks. I'm not going to go outside the outline in terms of teaching you extra stuff or new stuff that's not here. Um, but your final week, your week 14, again, there's no final exam for this course, just to say that again, our final test, it's just a presentation, right? So presentations are going to take the place of your final exam. So how much is your final project worth? And if you look at this, your project itself is worth 20%, but your final test is worth 25, right? But you also have this in-class exercise stuff that's worth 10. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm probably going to take this 10 and 20 and put it together for your final project. Not because I don't want to do in-class interactive exercises. I'm just going to do them differently. So this is what I'm going to do. When we have a quiz in class, like, you know, like a uh, kind of a pop quiz about stuff that we've learned from the previous, uh, you know, week or something like that. And if we're going to do anything like a lab, like I need you to do a little homework exercise or something like that, it's all going to be bonus. So if I do a pop quiz today, like as an example, let's say, if I was going to do it and if, you know, next week or whatever, it's not going to take away from your marks. It's just going to add to your marks, right? So if you if you don't hear, if you don't do it, you lose, right? You don't lose marks, you just lose opportunity, right? So to me, I want to give you incentive to be in class to do it. It's going to be due by the end of class when we do a pop quiz, lab, whatever it's going to be. 
So you're not going to have a chance to hand it in tomorrow or the next day or whatever because I want to try and mark it right away, right? And it's going to be kind of like either auto-marked, so quiz, or a lab that's a, did they do it or didn't, did, did they not do it, right? It might be a lab that you and a partner get together and do because I might give you a little exercise to try out, right? But whatever it is, it's got to be something so small and easy that it can be marked instantly, right? And again, it's like an, this idea of in-class interactive exercise, but instead of giving you 10%, I'm going to give you 10 bonus percent if you, if you do them all, which gives you an incentive to come to class and all that stuff. It could happen at any time. I could give you a pop quiz when you start first to come into class. It could be in the middle of class. It could be near the end of class, right? So I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to tell you when it's going to be, if it's going to be like that. And please don't ask me like I had. So Tom, next next week, uh, Professor, when we're going to have a you know, lab? Is it going to be like the first week? Of the, it's going to be when it's going to be, right? And don't ask me this. I missed last week, and I'm so sorry. I was sick. Uh, I didn't have a chance to do the lab. Too bad. It's like really, it's, it's a bonus. It's not going to hurt you. It's just going to help you. So if you're not here, you don't get it. If there's some extraneous circumstance, I mean, something that you know you you have a note for or whatever, okay. But for the most part, it's really an exercise to be done on the day of, right? So it's due probably Saturday at 5, right? That's what it's going to be due. So by end of class, pretty much. Questions around the schedule? Again, pretty much the same. That's, by the way, the book that you've opened up there is the old book. The new book is, is the one you want to use, not that one. That one's Angular 1. Um, so if you have any questions, please, this is the time to talk about the outline, right? All right, I got to do some, I don't know if you want to call it PR work for this one, but I got to be nice about what I'm going to say, but I'm going to tell it like this. Like I said earlier, this is probably the hardest course you're going to do at Centennial, right? Or one of the hardest courses. You have a lot of hard courses here, right? Like when it comes, especially when, when you're in semester five and semester six, depending on which, if you're fast tracking or not. But this one here, the reason why it's so tough is because most people do not understand JavaScript. They just don't, right? Even if you've taken a pure JavaScript course, Comp 125 now is being offered for a pure JavaScript course. Um, you get a kind of rudimentary uh, knowledge of JavaScript and so on. And then you learn a little bit more when you do web game programming. You do JavaScript and web game programming with us as well. We have that course. It's Comp 397. And again, it's an optional course. For some people who have done it with me, right? There's also Comp 392, which is advanced uh, graphics. That's also a very challenging course. I would say that was probably another one. And there's some people that have done all those, Selena, right? You're doing advanced graphics now, right? With Arvid, right? So those courses are all kind of linked or tied together in some way, right? And I'll tell you, they're, they're difficult courses. Any web course, first of all, web technologies in general are the most difficult platform to work with. Why? Because there's so much change like Angular 2, like ECMAScript 6 or 2015, or whatever you want to call it. All these things are continually continually changing and moving forward. And for us to keep track, for keep up with all this technology and all the tool sets that are related to the tech, right, is really hard. And that complicates our life. It's easier for us to work with something like, I'll be honest with you, C++, although, let me, go, let me take that back. It's easier to take to work with Java or C Sharp you know, or something like that, because those platforms are fairly stable. If I'm going to build something with a generic language like C Sharp or Java, I'm okay, right? From week to week, month to month, year to year, pretty much they stay stable. They, they might improve a few things or add a couple of functions, but nothing that great. Not so with the web. The web, every three months, we have a lot of change going on. And that produces problems because the web has breaking changes that breaks things that, that your code no longer works the same way it did before, right? So because of that, the book that we had from last, last year, Node.js or web uh, or mean development with or web development mean stack, whatever it was with Amos, the guy, the guy who wrote this book, won't work at all. Like some of the some of the code that you see in there, that's all in there. There's a lot of stuff that you'd have to rework and make work. Even when I first got that book in 2014, when I first did this course, and it was brand new off the shelf, it didn't work. Some of the code examples. And you might find the same thing with the, this book here, the book that was written in November of 2016, or published, sorry, published in November of 2016, because it was written beforehand. It can't be written and published in the same month. It's impossible, unless, I don't know, the guy's a wizard, right? Um, so that's one of the challenges, the documentation. And a lot of the documentation for the web is online. Okay, that's one thing I need to mention here. We're going to be talking about complex things, complex topics. The, the JavaScript that you're used to seeing in other uh, programs, like for things like using document.get on the by ID to push something to the to a to a page, 
You're not going to see that as much here. That's not the kind of JavaScript we're talking about here. The JavaScript we're talking about is all in the back end, and it's going to look weird. And you're going to look at it, and it's going to be totally new. And you're not going to understand why it's why it's formatted the same way, right? Also, because of this new version of ECMAScript that's come out, some of the syntax for JavaScript is totally changed. Let me talk about ECMAScript 6 for a second. So if I talk, I talk about ES6, ES6, right? It's called, it used to be called ECMAScript 6 or ECMAScript 2015. Uh, that's what it was. And if I look at the ECMAScript 6 features, right, you can see that it has things like const, the keyword const, right, and the keyword let, and arrow functions, and all kinds of other stuff that you've never seen before, class definitions, modules, different kinds of symbols, right, and it, it, it you know, kind of, you know, sets up a bunch of stuff that you've never seen before with JavaScript, Promises is the big one, right? That allows us to um, sometimes be confused because it's not the same old JavaScript anymore. I always want to test things, just not uh, you know features, and I can look at something called caniuse.com for that. So if I wanted to look at the class keyword because that's the new one that got added in with ECMAScript six, when we think about classes in JavaScript. We don't create classes like that. We make objects in JavaScript, right? With prototypes. But with ECMAScript 6, ECMAScript 6 classes have now become available. And for the most part, now globally, it's 70% penetration, right? And why? Because you can see that some of the versions of the browsers, depending on where they are globally, you may not have access to some of these things. But for example, all Internet Explorer browsers, incompatible, earlier versions. Uh, Edge is cool, right? And Opera Mini won't work. So on, and especially on feature phones and certain, certain things like that, the, that kind of, the, the class keyword and so on won't work so that's that's one of the things to know so 70 percent penetration we're pretty good here and it's going to work the other keyword is um let okay can anyone tell me what why would we use it says declares the variable with block level scope well does not is not always the case with javascript what's the problem with javascript and var keyword yeah i love it you're the first guy that said that you're awesome right hoisting is the issue right hoisting right and um to get you to understand that i'm just going to pull up a little drawing pad here because i'm not going to use the the board because you know otherwise you wouldn't be able to see it right so here's i'm just going to pull up sketchbook pro so i'll draw this up for you guys so basically what you have is and hopefully this is set up properly um i'm going to draw out a and forgive me for i'm not using a tablet to do this but Let's say, for example, you have this block scope. So there's a there's a scope. This block, this this um, you know object represents a bunch of code. And I want to think about this. There's a line of code here. There's a line of code here. There's a line of code here. And then your your code might look something like this. Okay, some kind of lines of code. Okay, if I declare, if I declare a variable, right? Sorry, let's move this side here. If I declare a variable here, make it red. And if I declare it at the top or the, the bottom of my code right here, right, with hoisting, what happens? Hoisting, what, what the interpreter does, and I'm just using these as pointers for a second, so please bear with me. If these are the lines of code, you know, uh, in, your, in your document, right, in your block scope. So let's say, for example, this is a function, right? The interpreter is going to start off at here, interpret this line, keep going down here, keep going down here. When it gets to this var statement, so this is a var. Right. If let's suppose this is a var statement, so I'm going to type in var. If this is what it is, okay. So I'll move this. Oh, that's not what I want. I meant. That's awesome. I meant to move it over here. So let's say, for example, this is a var statement that happens right here. The var statement actually gets hoisted, and that's why it's good that we use that word, to here at the top. So what? Why is that bad? It's bad because. What we expect is for this is where the declaration is going to happen down here, right? This here is where we expect the declaration to happen. But actually, it happens up here, which means it's available throughout the scope, not just from here on. That can cause weird glitches. You expect a, uh, um, a variable to be declared somewhere, but it's actually declared somewhere else. That's neat. 
So the, what fixes this is the let keyword. The let keyword doesn't allow anything like hoisting to occur. That's a really good advance in JavaScript. But again, and it's available 76% of browsers, right? We want to start using the let keyword as much as possible. Another really cool keyword that stops uh, some of our issues, right, in terms of problems is the const keyword. Const has got more penetration, 97% penetration. It's used cross-browser pretty much. We should be using that a lot of times when it comes to um, anything that's a constant. So const is OK. That's new. Let is OK. And class is OK. And that never used to be the case, especially last year. If you went, if I looked at caniuse.com last year, the penetration and the acceptance across browser around the same time last year would have been like 20%. So we had some other stuff back in the uh, back then to convert from ECMAScript 6, which is the latest version, or ECMAScript 2015, to ECMAScript 5, which was the previous version of JavaScript, right? ECMAScript 5 did not include all these extra features. So most browsers are ECMAScript 5, previous version, compatible, right? And we use things like Babylon JS or Babel JS you know, uh, to pass things on. And we also use something called TypeScript. TypeScript converts things from ECMAScript 6 to ECMAScript 5 for 100% compatibility and gives us typing for, um, for all of our code. So we're going to talk about TypeScript as we go forward in this course. TypeScript is created by a project that was created by Microsoft. But uh, Google has jumped on the bandwagon to use TypeScript uh, when they built Angular 2. All right, so Angular 2, uh, Angular JS 2. They kind of were looking for a language. They were looking at Go. They were looking at Dart. They were looking at other languages to kind of work with Angular. And they said, you know what? The guys at Microsoft are really doing a great job. And TypeScript is very close to all the ECMAScript 6 features plus some ECMAScript 7 features, stuff that even hasn't come out yet. It also gives us the ability for us to, and if I go to Playground with TypeScript for a second, I didn't do this for the first class. Um, here's an example of what it does. So here's the person class, right? And I've kind of shown you this example before. And I'm going to talk about this next week again. But this is kind of a preview. So my person class I've defined with the class uh, keyword, right? So my person class. I have something called a constructor. The constructor needs two parameters, a public name. Notice that public is the access modifier that we're used to from C Sharp. If you're a C Sharp programmer, this is very close to what you're used to. The only difference is constructor is normally the same name as the class, right, in C Sharp or in Java. In TypeScript, we just use constructor. So again, name is a string, and age is a number. What are the default, for those people who have done JavaScript before, what are the um, standard types that we have in JavaScript? Even though it's, it's a loosely typed language, we still have types. What are they? Do you know what they are? I just mentioned two. So we have string and number. What else? Anybody else have a, know of a type in JavaScript? Object is a type, but we don't want to use that one um, as much as possible. Any. That's a type. That's the any type, right? That's bad. Any means it'll be whatever. We don't know what type it is, right? How about Boolean, right? That's a type. Boolean is a type. And there's other ones, right? Well, what JavaScript or, or TypeScript does is it explicitly, it allows you to explicitly type uh, variables or parameters, right? But hold on, we're talking JavaScript. Why are we explicitly typing anything? For code hinting, for tooling, to help us find errors beforehand, to make sure that the context of what we're building is correct. And that's why, um, you know, as we move forward, I think, and we continuously move and, and um, evolved, evolve ECMAScript 6 into ECMAScript 7, I think it's going to be very TypeScript-like. And eventually, some languages like TypeScript and CoffeeScript and all the other uh, trans-compiling languages are going to go away because we're just going to have a, a really cool version of JavaScript that has all of this stuff built in. All right? Here's our student class, which extends the person class. There's inheritance for you, right? And what it does, it takes the person class, it changes the constructor, calls the super constructor here. And then what we do is we've given it another method called studies, right? And if I scroll down, what's missing from here? How can I make this stuff work? I got two classes, person and student, right? How can I make proof that this all works? First of all, on the left, TypeScript. On the right, pure JavaScript in ECMAScript 5 standard, right? So fully compatible 
with um, with what we have today, cross browser, right? So this is what it looks like. We had these other kinds of functions before. Let's go back. So if I was to do that, if I was to declare a variable uh, of type person, right? I could say something like this: let Tom equal to a new person, right? And I need a couple things there. One of them is the name, so Tom. And my age, uh, thirty, right? Wrong. And then. I'll go if I do Tom dot right says hello. Right, we can see that what it does is it continue to add the same stuff. So there's that new statement that I put in there. It looks almost identical, right? On this point, it changes the let to var. This is called transpilation. It transpiles from something like an ECMAScript six standard or the the latest standard with TypeScript to ECMAScript five. So you may see some of that going forward. This is just a bit of a preview. Don't worry about understanding this right now or remembering it. I don't expect that. I just know I'm telling you what we're doing. Yes. This would all do the hoisting. But the great thing about it is even if it did the hoisting, it's set up so that way um, it takes care of that issue. Right? Because remember, it's going to hoist the function too. Not It, it hoists everything. It doesn't just hoist uh, variables. Functions, variables, objects, whatever. It hoists it all. But it won't affect us as much. So we're going to use the let keyword as much as possible. Now, the good thing about TypeScript, not only can you go from this to ECMAScript 5, but you can also go to ECMAScript 6 if you really want to. Which means if you use let const here, it'll stay let const on this side. Right? So really, really powerful. And you can also make it backwards compatible with previous versions of ECMAScript. ECMAScript 3, as an example, was the previous iteration. Right? So it can work for older browsers. Yeah. In this case, over here on this side, the var is actually a, um, an alias. This is what it is, a reference to this function. It's, it's called, actually, this is an anonymous uh, closure that we're using. And this is how you would create a, an object. This is a prototype. We're using prototypical, prototypal inheritance or prototypal um, objects creation on this side. So this is what it really looks like when we do classes in ECMAScript 5. On the left side, this is the uh, the way it would look in ECMAScript 6, very very similar to this, without the typing. ECMAScript 6 does, does not do explicit typing. It doesn't include that. Only TypeScript does. So it's syntactic sugar. It kind of makes it so we get better code hinting. So whatever ever our, our intent is when we create a class, you get code hinting so we don't make errors in the future. That's what it's for, more than anything else. Also, it gives us great code hinting for JavaScript libraries that are not supported by default within your text editor. That's a great thing about TypeScript, right? So it gives us support for TypeScript libraries and or other libraries like Node.js. Gives us support for Node.js within the text editor. We never had that support before. Speaking of, of text editors, I'm not going to go too much into this right now. Today is setup day, like I said. And one of the things I want you to talk about is, or think about is, what text editor are you going to use for this course? I'm going to be using Visual Studio Code. That's the text editor of choice for me when it comes to uh, doing things for the web. Right? And by the way, I've put some of these links already on your um, Slack channel. We're going to talk about the Slack channel in a second. But this link here, Visual Studio Code, is what I'm going to be using primarily. You can use other ones. And I've included some of those other links in your Slack channel. We'll talk about them in a second. Why visit Visual Studio Code? This is made with TypeScript, right, for the web. It has awesome JavaScript uh, code hinting, right? And as a text editor, it's not as fat as Visual Studio, 70 million lines of code. So we're not going to be using that one. I'm not going to be using that one. But you can use whatever text editor you want. You want to use Sublime? Go ahead. You want to use Atom? Excellent. You want, you want to use Visual Studio? Go ahead. But Visual Studio itself, the problem with it is it doesn't meld well with um, console as much. It takes a, a few extra steps. And it, it hides a lot, of the a lot of the control that you're going to need from a console perspective. This course is console intensive, right? So we're going to do a lot more console work or terminal work. Who has a Mac in the room? Anybody? OK. If you've got a Mac, you're golden. You're gonna be, it's going to be a little easier for you than it is for people who don't have a Mac. I mean, if you have a PC, which is most people in this room, 
I'm going to show you the PC installation of all the other tool sets that we need, right? Because there's more involved on the PC side of the house than there is on the Mac. Mac, from the get-go, your terminal is working. You install something, you're going to have access to it. PC, there's some changes you need to make in the environment variables for the most part, and we're going to talk about how to do that, right? Yes. You bunch of Linux should be fine. Again, if you have if you have a Linux machine or a Mac machine, you're golden. You're fine. If you have a PC, some configuration we need to do uh, to make it all work. So Visual Studio is Visual Studio Code is what I'm going to be using, but you don't have to. You can use whatever editor you feel like, okay? Because it's got to be comfortable for you. And there's some really great ones out there. Um, that I'm talking about. The other thing is before we take a, I'm going to go again. I'm going to try and break every hour, right? Because we have four hours together, right? So everybody, but every hour we'll take about five or ten minutes. Grab a coffee, that kind of stuff, and come back. Hopefully, coffee is, is coffee available today. Um, damn it! Sorry, you know. Uh, Sunday's complete. Well, we're not. On, thank God, we're not on Sundays. Don't don't try and get me here on Sundays. Right? All right. We're also going to be using Slack as a communication tool for this course. Now, you might be used to um, Discord as an example. The Discord is another very popular tool there. It's very similar to Discord, but we're going to be using Slack. I have a Slack channel that I want you guys to join, right, already. It is called comp308-w2017.slack.com, all right? I've made it available to anyone that has a my.centennialcollege.ca uh, email address. So please go and join Slack, right? I have now this Slack channel is shared with the previous class, right? And anybody else, I made it available so anybody else from any other section like if uh, someone from Professor Ilya's section wants to join our Slack channel from a communication perspective or whatever, or ask questions, it's totally cool. So please join me on Slack, right? Because I'm going to be using Slack in addition to eCentennial for communication purposes. When I make announcements and that kind of stuff, it's going to be through Slack. I also recommend downloading and installing Slack both on your PC or Mac and on your phone. Why on the phone? You're like going to be like, how come I would use my phone to communicate with you on Slack? Because I'm going to be—you can text me directly, right? That's the one reason why you want to—you want to use Slack, right? You don't have to know my phone number, right? That's number one. That's the first thing. So I don't need to know your phone number. You can text me. You can uh, send files to me. Um, all that kind of stuff is available through Slack. And at the same time, you can collaborate with your classmates as well, right? Any kind of people that you're working with, you can create your own channels, sub channels if you like, or anything else. And it's a great little tool um, when in terms of integrations. So if you want to you know, integrate with uh, Google Drive, with GitHub, and all kinds of other stuff, uh, you know, the Slack channel is the way we're going to do it. And I've already shared some, some links on the, on the Slack channel, which I'm going to go over for today, right? For example, and when you join the Slack channel, um, I've included the Node.js link, which we're going to need today, the GitHub link. And we're going to start from here up here. I've already kind of included all these in the Slack channel for today. And I'm hoping that everyone joins me. Again, some people were like, well, do I really have to join Slack? I really don't want to. It's up to you at the end of the day. I'm not going to force you. But I'm going to make a lot of announcements. When I change stuff or if I, if I you know, revamp a due date or something like that, a lot of the announcements are going to be through Slack. And I'm going to put a lot of, if you want to follow along or if you want to do, you know, if you're remote that day, I'm going to look at Slack to see if I get any kind of questions. Um, because when I take breaks, I'm going to look at Slack and say, Here, here's a question coming from Slack. Um, here's the answer for that. There's three sub-channels in Slack, in the Slack channel that I'm using. One of them is developer. Another one is general. And the last one is random. Random is where we put like, you know, random pictures, whatever. Some interesting, you know, stuff that you want to put in here, right? Um, any kind of random thoughts or whatever or, or some some weird stuff you can put that in random Please don't put random thoughts like that in general general is for my announcements <laughs> Any links I want to share with you that, that kind of stuff right Developer is where you want to put code samples that kind of stuff By the way, please don't share your whole assignment one or two inside developer. I would just take it down, right? That's not the point of this this point is not for you to um for a, from an abuse perspective, it's there for us to share and collaborate, right? So again, what I want you guys to think about is when you join Slack, you'll have the ability for us to collaborate and talk. Um, at the same time, you, if you want to contact me and you, you have a problem, that's great. Okay? Speaking of contact me, um, 
I'll be available on Slack from about 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. seven days a week, right? So you have access to talk to me throughout that time, right? Now my office hours are, you know, kind of arranged, right? So you and I, if you want to meet with me or something like that, one on one, uh, kind of a face to face thing. I'm a very busy guy, but we can arrange things. For example, on Tuesdays, I do have a space uh, before 6:30 p.m. on Tuesdays, probably from around one o'clock in the afternoon, where we can get together some office hours there. Um, but it's gonna change. It's gonna it's gonna rotate around. Sometimes I'll be busier than others. I'm probably going to book you within a half hour time slot. So when we do get together, if we have to get together face to face, be prepared for what you want to talk about. Don't just come and say, well, I don't know why it doesn't work and I need about a, two, a couple hours with you to help me code. No, no. Be very specific about what you want and then I'll try and help you out if it's a, if it's a coding question. If it's another kind of question, like uh, some kind of administration type of question, like I, you know, I want to go into your other section, Tom, or whatever, I don't do that. You have to go through the advisors for that. Um, if it's some other problem that you have and you want to talk to me face to face and you want to do it like um, you know kind of in person here at the school, that's fine. You know we can we can start off with half an hour and usually I'm in a two thirty. That's where my meeting place is, right? However, we can also meet remotely. I can also meet you through Google Hangouts if we want to do something on Google Hangouts. Or let's say you and your partner have a question and I want to kind of cover both of you, but I'm not physically here at the school. We can do that. We can arrange those things. Uh, but for the most part, a lot of the stuff is covered in the videos. So if, uh, remember, when I make a video like I've done, uh, like I'm doing right now, live, right? The videos are going to be shared, and there, and the link for the video is up on Slack already. If you look, if you kind of join Slack, and if you go kind of towards the top of, of where I started the conversation, my YouTube channel is there. Here's my YouTube channel, right? As well as my YouTube playlist for this course, which is this, right? And then I talked about um, a couple things. VS Code, right? So Visual Studio Code is, is one of them. There's another one called Cloud9 that I recommend as well. Cloud9, um, it's kind of neat. It doesn't require, well, this is the wrong view. But it doesn't require um, any kind of setup whatsoever, right? Um, well, kind of no setup. Let me, let me kind of go into there, and I'll show you what it looks like. So C9.io. You can sign up for free. And you can also kind of integrate GitHub or Bitbucket if you're someone who's a Bitbucket person, right? So that's what Cloud9 does. And Cloud9 is an online, fully uh, cloud-based IDE, right? A text editor, and then it also includes a little bit of a Ubuntu server terminal at the bottom with no setup. There is zero setup for this course because it has, well, very little setup. How about that? It has Node installed already, right? It has Heroku Tool Belt installed already. It has Git installed already, all the stuff. And it even has Mongo installed already. So all those things that we, would, we were going to be hard pressed to take care of, and it's going to take us about another hour to do that, <laughs> all those setups, it's got to be all ready to go, right? So if you want to avoid setup and you want to purely be on the web, you know, then you can use Cloud9 and you're pretty much ready to go with everything that we need to do, right? And there's some tricks to make, you know, to kind of test it. There's some testing tricks and there's some really good, um, you know, kind of examples on how to do that. So highly recommend Cloud9. Again, it's free for a couple of workspaces. I think you don't have unlimited workspaces, but you do have a couple of free workspaces you can use uh, to get this going, right? So I think that's that's a really cool thing uh, to use. And it combines well with MongoLab, or MLab now is what it's called, as well as Heroku, which is where we want to try and ho host most of our apps in this course. Okay, so that's Cloud9. I also mentioned in the Slack channel, um, in the Slack channel, I also mentioned a couple of other things, right? Well, we talked about um, uh, IDEs or text editors. One of the components that we're gonna we're gonna be talking about in this course is GitHub, right? GitHub. Who does not have a GitHub account? Anybody? You don't? Yeah, you need to get a GitHub account, right? So. So you guys, people who haven't had me before, if you haven't had me as a professor, then you don't have a GitHub account. If you've had me as a professor, I guarantee you already have one. Yeah, I don't have you. I, I'm here because people the best. Oh, okay. Thank you for that. But I don't know. But I don't know about that. But but what I want you to do is go up on GitHub now and grab or, or open up a GitHub account. It's required for this course. Okay. So if you have a GitHub account, that's fantastic, right? All I need you to do is. I mean, again, I recommend the GitHub ex Education Pack, and I put that up there too on the Slack channel. The GitHub Education Pack is really cool because 
it allows us to have, and I'm just going to go there for a second. Here's the GitHub Education Pack. The Student Pack. What it does is it gives you, when you sign up for GitHub for the first time, all your repositories, right, are public. But the GitHub Education Pack um, gives you unlimited private repositories. So maybe for your assignments and maybe for your project with your partner, you want to make them private. If you haven't signed up for the GitHub Education Pack before, this is the time to do it, and it's free. Also gives you $50 of platform credit with DigitalOcean, which is a Toronto-based cloud service, right, which is really cool, as well as um, they keep on adding more stuff here all the time, which is really cool. Microsoft Imagine, Azure, which we're going to talk about that later on. Namecheap, you get a free SSL certificate from Namecheap and a, a domain <laughs> for a year, right? from Namecheap. That's pretty cool for free of students. SendGrid to, to relay emails from your um, um, Node app, right? So you can make your contact forms work properly. Stripe was a payment gateway, which is pretty cool, and other things. So lots of really cool things with the education pack from GitHub. And again, I put that link um, inside of Slack. OK. So before I take a break, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. And, I, and the one question I want to ask you guys, because people who know GitHub and Git, can someone tell me what the difference is between Git and GitHub? Right? Because that's kind of a point. It's always been a point of contention for some people. Anyone know what the difference is? GitHub is the GitHub site where it hosts. GitHub. Git is the. It's software. Okay. They're close. Framework. The framework, not really. See, so you're trying to you're trying to find five words for it. And in an interview, in an interview, I don't want you to say it that way. Okay, I want, we're going to talk about how you're going to say it in an interview. What is the difference between get and get up? What's the difference between get and get up? Tell me what it is. What, what, use your own words. Tell me what the 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 differences between get and GitHub. Git's the actual website. GitHub's the actual website. Okay. Git is the tool you use to up I'm just repeating so that everyone can hear you because it's a unidirectional mic. Git is the tool you use to upload stuff to GitHub. Right. It's close. Again, not exactly true. Right. Huh? What do you think it is? GitHub is a repository hosting rest website. Okay. And Git is a CLI. You guys are all kind of dancing around it. But basically, this is how I want you to talk about GitHub and Git. Git, right, is a version control system that you install locally on your machine. All right? It allows you to do what two, what three things does Git allow you to do? Right? Git, just Git. Version control, obviously. It creates a backup, right, locally I'm talking about. And it also allows you even locally to collaborate. Well, those are the same three things, collaboration and communication, that GitHub allows you to do, but even more effectively. GitHub is a cloud service, software as a service, right? That offers an online repository where you can connect your local Git repository, right? And upload, so that's why everyone says kind of the same things, to GitHub so that you can share it with everybody, right? A shareable platform, use it as backup, right? And perform version control. And a lot of other things, by the way, like issue tracking, project management, branch management, <laughs> Right, all kinds of other stuff. Right, so Git and GitHub kind of work in tandem, but Git can work on its own. Git is local and, and available to your system. And I'm going to draw it out after the break, but I think we should take about a 10 minute break here, right? Because we're probably on the hour right now, so we're about 1:58. We've gone, kind of gone for about an hour. Let's take a 10 minute break. Get uh, get yourself a bio break. We kind of settled in. Um, if you need, if there is any kind of coffee anywhere, McDonald's. I don't know. Go grab whatever you need. Have a smoke or. Call your girlfriend and come back, right? And then we'll continue. Or boyfriend, Selena, sorry. <laughs> 